Okay. So today we're going to, as you know, it's a waning moon cycle now. So naturally, we adjust our practice to fit the phases of the moon. So as you know, on the full moon, last time we came together and practiced on the full moon, we had a very kind of restorative and grounding practice in which we just um, delved into the Ashtavakra Gita, you know, and, and, and did the meditation called the boundless ocean. So we did a few poses and then we rested in that. So today we'll do a slightly more vigorous sequence, a few extra poses. But as you know, the um, volume knob for how intense the practice is going to be is in your hands. So we'll offer some options and some cues. Uh, today we'll also investigate at the very end, the Ashtavakra Gita. I, it should be here. I'll, I'll find it maybe, hopefully, God willing. But I want to close with some non-dual meditation. So we'll take about maybe 45, 50-ish minutes of asana, and then we'll close with some... Um, non-dual meditation. Welcome, dear Chandra Ji. Welcome, Madeline. Oh, hello. <laughs> okay, so hello. Oh, good to see you all. So we'll start on our back today. It'd be nice if you had a strap or some sort of device like that, like a, 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 a what do you call it, like a tie or a blanket or a t-shirt or something of that sort. And of course, it's not necessary. We can also use our hands. We're going to do a Supta Parangustasana series. Very nice kind of intro warm-up series. We'll start on our back. I often recommend that you start with your knees bent and your feet flat on the floor. Not necessarily. If you feel like you can go right into Shavasana, you can. But I like to have the knees bent so that you can feel the four corners of the feet releasing into the mat. So just note the texture of the mat under the feet. Note the way the big toe mound, little toe mound, inner edge of the heel, and outer edge of the heel melts down into the mat. Now, traditionally in Shavasana, we have the hands by the sides of the torso, but remember you can have any kind of configuration that you'd like. You can have both hands on the lower belly. You can have the hands on the upper abdomen, which are very nice configurations for connecting to the movement of breath in the diaphragmatic muscle. Or you could have both hands over the heart, which is very centering, reassuring and grounding. Or you can have one hand on the belly and one hand in the heart. So all of these are perfectly acceptable too. And having the hands on the torso has the advantage of kind of reclaiming this moment as a unique moment in time. Almost as if by placing the hands on the torso, you are affirming that you are here, alive, on the mat, here, now, at this moment. So with the feet on the floor and the hands either by the sides of the torso or on top of the torso, let's start by acknowledging just the simple aliveness that inheres in this moment. Kabir, the mystic, has that poem about the fish who was complaining of being thirsty. And he went to the guru and, you know, guru fish. And he asked the guru fish, like, where is the water? And the guru fish, like, laughed and laughed and laughed. So, of course, mystical literature is full of parables like this, especially in the Zen tradition, of teachers just laughing at us because we're striving and seeking and searching. And we feel as if there's some kind of journey in time. And many of us feel like it's a journey in space. I have to go to the Himalayas or to this or that temple, or in a couple of years, then I will be enlightened. I have to first experience Samadhi and then I'm enlightened, etc. Now, as you know, right now, lying here, you are aware of this moment of the sensual data, like the smells, the tastes, the textures, the sounds, of the subtle data, like the thoughts and emotions and the quality of this moment, subtly speaking. You're aware of all of that. And you are not only aware of all of these objects of awareness, you are aware also 
of being aware. Not that awareness is an object to itself. It's more the case that awareness is self-revealing. Notice that you are indubitably sure now that you are here, that you are. So as you come onto your mat, as you relax into this moment, as you acknowledge that you are here, you are also acknowledging the simple fact of awareness being aware of itself. And that's a remarkable thing. So consider a light. If a room is dark, you'll need the light to illumine the objects in that dark room. As we learn in the Kato Upanishad, it shining, everything else shines. By its light is everything revealed. So just like that light, awareness lights up the field of your experience, the smells, tastes, texture, sounds, thoughts, emotions. But, and this is important, to see light, does not require you to use a secondary light. That light in and of itself reveals itself. And as you're lying there, reclaiming this moment as a singularity in your journey, consider this next point. You are aware of time. The time is now. Whatever the clock might be showing, whatever the first half of your day might have felt like, whatever you expect the next half of your day to look like, you can at least acknowledge that in the spectrum of time, past, present, and future, that you are here now. And you are aware of time. Next, you're aware of space. You're aware that the body is on the mat. You're aware that the mat is on the floor and that the floor is in a room or in a garden, etc., etc. All the objects in space and even space itself, you're aware of that. So if right now you feel yourself to be aware of time, and aware of space, then awareness is not in time, nor is it in space. Space and time are experiences in awareness. Now the joke that makes the guru fish laugh. How then can enlightenment be time-based or space-based when enlightenment is the mere recognition of your essential nature as awareness. You were enlightened before you came to this practice. You will always be enlightened from, ev no, sorry, you were awareness before you came to this practice. You will always be that awareness after this practice, even after the end of this body and mind. And even now, you are effortlessly that self-revealed, self-effulgent awareness. Enlightenment is nothing more than recognizing that now. That's it. We're done. Be with that. Be as that. And we'll return to this in the end of the quote-unquote class. But before we do our first quote-unquote thing, 
just note that the reason we're practicing is not to be anything other than what we already are, and nor are we practicing. That's a very important point. Yes, I will cue poses. Yes, the body will move through shapes. The breath will assume certain configurations. There will be invitations to visualize this and that, chant this and that, etc. But you are not doing it. So to begin, let's take up the verse from the Bhagavad Gita. And I'll just chant a bit of it. Om Prakrityaiva Cha Karmani Kriyanani Sarvashaha Om Nature alone, natures. He sees who sees that the self, the witness, does nothing. Om Danur Grihitva Panishadam Mahastram Sharam Upasa Nishitam Samdaita Ayamya Tadbhava Gatena Chitasa Lakshyam Tadevaksharam Sumhya Vidhi Om Pick up the mighty bow that is this practice. Place upon it the arrow of a mind purified through meditation and selfless service. Draw back the bowstring of inwardness and recognize, recognize your true nature by hitting upon the mark. Brahman, being, consciousness, bliss, absolute. Om yogena chitasya padena vacham malam sharirasya chavaidyakena yopa karutam prabaram muninam patanjalim pranjale ranatosmi abahu purushakaram shanka chakra sitaranam sahasra shirasam shvetam pranamami patanjalim hariyom Salutations to the lineage of teachers, beginning with Adi Yogi Lord Shiva himself, manifest as Patanjali Maharshi, whose writings on medicine, grammar, and yoga have brought purity to body, speech, and mind, thereby granting final liberation for many. Salutations to Patanjali Maharshi. Salutations to the Parampara, the unbroken lineage of Gurus. May the flame, may the Shakti of this lineage transfer from teacher to student, unbroken, unabatingly, unceasingly. We practice in the name of that Guru Shakti now. May we be illumined. Om. Peace, peace, peace. Begin now to note where in the chest you can feel the breath. So when I use the word you, of course, I'm not talking to you as awareness now. I'm speaking to body, breath, and really to intellect. So note if you feel the breath in the chest. If so, gently guide the breath down into the lowermost part of the torso. So in some sense, you're going to be breathing down into the pelvic bowl. And it is very nice actually to have one or two hands here by the upper abdomen or the lower belly, because then you can feel the belly expanding like a balloon, side ribs expanding, upper abdomen expanding as you inhale. And as you exhale, feel the side ribs relaxing towards the spine and the upper abdomen softening towards the back body. The idea is not to breathe so much with the chest, as with the abdominal wall. So you'll hear this in pranayama too. The chest stays relatively stationary. I mean, not all the way, don't fuss about this, but the chest should be broad and spacious, even during the exhale. So feel for that exhale as a function of the upper abdomen and lower belly and side ribs. Note now that in order to breathe into your lower belly, the breath must be longer, both in the inhale and in the exhale. 
but be sure not to breathe more slowly than you feel capable of breathing today. That is to say, as you do these next few quote unquote pranayamas, watch the corners of the mouth. If you notice any hardening of the mouth, like the mouth is a line or something like that, then simply relax the corners of the mouth and allow them to turn upwards slightly, like the mischievous half smile of the Buddha. And add to that too, the softening of the jaw, meaning the unclenching of the jaw and the softening of the base of the neck. So remember, as we discussed in our opening meditation, prakritaiva cha karmani kriyanani sarvashaha. These things feel like doing, but it's doing only on the level of the body, breath, mind, and intellect. All the while, almost like a movie screen, underlying the movie of this yoga practice is you, that witness, that formless awareness in which these experiences come and go. So don't lose touch with that. I mean, you can't actually, even if you tried, you could never not be awareness, but rather recognize that you are awareness, even as we do this next thing. So with the face soft, breathing into the lower belly, breathing with the side ribs and upper abdomen, now start to add your Samma Vritti Pranayama. This is optional. Many of you might like to just stay with this deep diaphragmatic breathing for now. Even that too is optional. Actually, everything is optional. We did just establish that you are already enlightened. What can we add? But um, if you'd like, Samma Vritti Pranayama is inhaling for a count of, let's say, four beats and exhaling for the same duration, four beats. How quickly or slowly you breathe is up to you. That you breathe rhythmically is the emphasis here. Those of you following along with the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra classes, know that as you inhale, it's apana vayu, energy moving down through the crown of the head and into the um, I guess you could say the tailbone, energy is moving down to strike the kundalini shakti, etc., etc. And as you exhale, you know that it's pranavayu. Yet in the Vijnana Bhairava, it's asking you to see it as udanavayu, upward moving energy. Right? So those of you who are there for those classes, you can add that now too. Inhale, feel that bindu, that point of light or some other visualization moving down through the dwada shanta that place above the crown of the head, and maybe just down into the um, hridaya, the heart. And as you exhale, feel that energy moving from the hridaya up and out through the crown of the head. So if none of that made any sense, forget it. That's just for those of you who are doing also the Vijnana Bhairava stuff. Okay, anyway, next thing to note, and this is also true for the Vijnana Bhairava first instruction is, that there is now a natural pause between the inhale and the exhale, and again between the exhale and the inhale. In that tantra, it's called a visarga, which is a Sanskrit uh, grammatical term. We say namaha or kamaha, like that. So that visarga now, that pause, that little natural gap between the two breaths, go ahead and lengthen that too. So as you inhale, four beats, pause at the end of the inhale and hold the visarga, quote unquote, for four beats before exhaling for another four beats and then holding at the end of the exhale for another four beats. Those of you in the Pranayama series, you know this is Puraka, Antara Kumbhaka, Rechaka and Bahir Kumbhaka. Puraka is inhale, antara kumbhaka, inside retention, holding the breath in with the lungs full, exhalation, rechaka, and bahir, outside kumbhaka, holding the breath out after the exhale. Again, these pauses are entirely optional. And as we stress time and time again, watch the face, watch the corners of the mouth, watch the jaw, and watch the neck. 
insofar as you feel rested, relaxed, and soft in the face, proceed. But if you notice any tightening, either shorten the breaths, omit the pauses, or just omit all pranayama altogether. So we'll give you a few moments now to find a rhythm. Ideally, you'll keep that rhythm up throughout the class. It might change as you get warmer and as the class gets more vigorous. But the rhythm here is to give you a beat for the dance. In Indian classical music, as we discussed two or three weeks ago, it's called a teen tal, which means 16 beats. Notice that you've just now created a teen tal with your inhale, pause, exhale, pause. Each one is four beats giving you a total set of 16 beats. So in Indian classical music, that would be the whole bar or measure before going into the next measure. Remember, you'll recall that these poses are all a type of temple dance used to entertain a deity in puja once that deity has been invited into the murti. And in fact, in the Maha Nirvana Tantra, many of you will enjoy this, in the Maha Nirvana Tantra, there is uh, very detailed instructions for manasa puja, the internal and subtle worship of the deity within. And it says there to offer the restless mind as a kind of temple dance to entertain the deity. What a delicious idea. The mind is whirling and whirling in samsara. That itself is a dance to entertain makali or whoever it is sitting in your heart. Anyway, along the same lines, in the Bahir Puja, the external worship, your poses, that is the dance. So we need a rhythm. Now you establish it. Inhale four beats. Hold four beats. Exhaling four beats. and holding four beats. One last piece before we start to move, and that is the Vyana Vayu, meaning begin now to breathe as if you could breathe in through the pores of the skin. So breath is not just a matter of breathing through the nose and into the lungs, but a kind of exploration of the whole body, breathing as if the entire length and breadth of the skin was the organ of respiration. And we've often invoked the image of the frog breathing through the skin. Breathe through your feet, breathe through your calves, inner groin, outer hips, upper thighs, hamstring. Breathe through the palms, through the armpits, like that. Well, those of you coming to the Vignana Bhairava classes, you'll see that all of these instructions are just from there. Attend to the skin. It is a subtle boundary containing vastness, etc., etc., right? So almost all these little kind of invitations for awareness. There's subtle practices that Lord Shiva is offering Devi in the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. Why? Because Devi is asking, how can the para be apara? What is the nature of para para? How can the transcendent be imminent? How can the awareness that you say that I am be present in and throughout all the smells and tastes and objects that I can perceive? Where is God in the world is what Devi is asking. And Shiva is saying, don't take my word for it. Practice. See for yourself what I mean. And so these instructions. All right. Now, taking your own time, we're going to move into some poses. Many of you might just like to do this. So for the rest of the class, you might like to just stay in meditation or be on the floor and breathe and be. Others amongst you might be nourished by some poses 
and some movement in the body. So if that's you, then our next pose is Apanasana. On the exhale, hugging the knees into the chest. And here you might choose to flex the toes back, dorsiflexion, lifting the arches of the feet or not. In any case, you might hold the knees, the shins, you might hold the backs of the knees. And you might, if you'd like, add a side-to-side -side rocking motion. So that might be interesting to you to do. You might rock back and forth. And in any case, I invite you to tuck the chin in a smidgen and elongate the spine. So imagine growing through the crown of your head, just lengthening as if to create more space between each vertebral disc. Then holding just the right knee, bring the left foot to the floor. So left knee is bent, left foot is on the floor. And loop the strap if you have one around the sole of the right foot or sans the strap, you can grab it with your hand. So I recommend the right hand making a kind of peace sign to catch the right big toe. Left hand can stay on the left hip. Then with the exhale, start to straighten that right knee, pointing the sole of the right foot up towards the sky. Now, if you'd like, you can straighten the left leg, coming into a slightly fuller supta padangustasana. Flex the left toes back, scrubbing the left heels forward. Why do we flex the left toes back? Well, one, to lift the arches of the foot, thereby activating and energizing the foot. But two, to reclaim that left leg. So it's a part of the pose as well. Now, whether you have a strap around the sole of the foot or you're holding it with the hand, there's a nice stretch in the upper outer arm. Relax the shoulder down away from the ear. That's it, Jenna. And release the outer edge of the shoulder down towards the mat. So it's a kind of counter movement. You're reaching up for that right toe and yet you're descending that right shoulder down towards the mat. Return to your Viana Vayu. And here, I mean, Viana Vayu really means the pervasive wind, the movement of energy throughout the body. It has a very mystical connotation as something that happens post enlightenment or really post Samadhi. It's called Sahaja Samadhi, the ability to see consciousness in and throughout all things, even after Nirvikalpa Samadhi. But for now, I just mean it in a more pedestrian way, like the flow of blood and the flow of attention. So with that in mind, breathe through the calf and through the right hamstring. Breathe through the back of the right knee. Good. And those of you using the straps, walk the hands up the strap so the elbows are straight. And relax. Remember, you can bend the knee any amount if the hamstring feels tight. And if you'd like, you can gently start to straighten that knee to taste. Let's give this pose a few moments to have its effect on the body, breath, and mind. Now on the exhale, if you'd like, you can hold the pose longer if you choose, but if you'd like, exhale, draw the right knee back into the chest, maybe moving the strap out of the way, and then hugging both knees into the chest. So return to Apanasana now, coming back to, I guess, home base here. You may flex the toes back, you may point them, you can do whatever, but just make sure the feet are part of the pose so we don't lose touch with some parts of the body. Let all be included. Now, holding the right knee, go back to bringing the left foot to the floor. And this time, all of us will straighten the left knee on the floor. So pushing the left heel forward. Now with the left hand on the right knee, guide the right knee down to the left side of the room as you reach your right arm out to the right. You know, the interesting thing is if we go by the Maha Nirvana Tantra, then this entire practice can be done in the mind, actually. Think of it, manasa yoga. Hatha yoga, but subtly done. In fact, many meditators, even though the body is still, feel themselves to be kind of swirling about or rocking back and forth. 
or swaying. The body is perfectly still, yet they feel like there's a motion. And maybe some of you might have felt that when you're sleeping and then suddenly you feel like you're falling. You know, like that. It is described in, in verse 19 of the Pratya Bhikya Hridaya Sutra. Shema Raja, in a kind of tongue in cheek way, uh, says, One who has attained the goal of Tantra sways side to side as if drunk. But the way the Sanskrit there is phrased, he's, he's talking about the subtle body, you know, not necessarily the physical body. Although we know that Sri Ramakrishna, he had to be supported. Because when he was in inebriated, kind of God-intoxicated state, he, people used to think he was dead drunk. He would actually sway and stagger about. And sometimes he would touch people. And Swami Saradananda, in his Leela Prasanga, says that it was almost as if I drank um, pulped marijuana, which is bang, you know, you know bang, that uh, marijuana drink. And it was like a heavy intoxication when Sri Ramakrishna would tap them. But of course, these are all energetic kind of pranaya, pranamaya kosha kind of experiences. So if you're like not moving the body, you can still practice by mentally kind of doing these poses. Inhale, bring that right knee back up to center. And hug the left knee back into the chest. Holding the left knee now, bring the right foot to the floor. And if you'd like, you can loop the strap around the sole of the left foot and straighten that left knee. So maybe some of you are looping the strap. Others amongst you are catching that left foot with the left hand. Your right knee stays bent. And then as a final detail, actually, before you straighten the right knee, see to it that your lower back is releasing into the floor totally. I mean, to some degree, it's going to arch away from the floor. The straighter that um, leg is and the broader your chest is there will be naturally some arching in the lower back. But to the extent to which it is possible, press the lower back down into the floor. And I'm making that sound more forceful than it should be. Release the lower back. Soften the lower back, the sacrum, into the floor. And keeping that, maintaining that grounding of the lower back, start to straighten the right knee. Naturally, as you straighten the right knee, the lower back will arch. So we're looking for a slight counter movement here. Let's get a bit more nuanced. Spin the inner edge of the right thigh down towards the floor. So that right foot should not be splaying open. That right thigh is in neutrally rotated position, not externally rotated position. Relaxing the shoulder heads down away from the ears and softening the outer shoulders back towards the floor even as you reach up towards that left foot. This is Supta Padangushtasana. And I've been experimenting with something, and it's the um, installation of uh, Sanskrit phonemes into the hands during puja. It's called Nyasa, or the placing of mantras in certain parts of the body. So you can imagine that whatever you're touching, let's say you're touching the toe, you can imagine that you're placing into that toe a kind of mantra. So those of you who come to our pujas, you'll see there's a part of the puja where we chant the whole Sanskrit alphabet. You know, ang kang kang gang kang ngang ang gustabhyam namaha. And then there's ing chang chang jang chang, like that. So the idea is to place letters, which are of course powerful energy corpuscles, if you will, into the body, charging the body up with the mantric, mantric potency of these, these syllables. And interestingly, yesterday at the monastery, there was a person here describing to me um, her theory that, I, we don't know how true this is, you know, she's been studying it for a while, but she's interested in the parallels between Judaism and Hinduism, as indeed are we. Remember, we had that class on the Kabbalah, the Sefer Bahir next to the Pratyabhikya Hidaya Sutra. And our theory was that the tantric emanationist model is almost one for one, the Kabbalistic idea of the, you know. So we were talking and she told me yesterday that there are these studies where people in India, small groups in India, claim Jewish heritage. And then Jewish people in the Levant say, no, that can't be. They do a genetic test and they find that they are actually Jewish, though they're Indian. 
So it's very interesting. And so this woman that I was talking to yesterday, her um, study now is to, to show that Jewish people in the Levant are Indian immigrants. And she herself is Jewish. She's not Indian. She's Jewish. But she just want very inspired to do this kind of thinking. So I thought that was kind of cool. Anyway, when you're done, you can exhale and draw that left knee into the chest. And you might just go straight into the twist if you want. If you prefer, you can come back to Appanasana and recenter. But otherwise, if you'd like, you can place that right hand on the left knee and guide that left knee down to the right. So it's your choice. Coming back to Appanasana, find the breath again, and then going into the twist or going straight into the twist. And remember, in this twist, it's not so much about bringing that left knee down to the floor on the right. It's more about releasing the left outer shoulder into the mat or letting that left arm descend into the floor. Turn the palm of the left hand up towards the ceiling. This is to create spaciousness across the chest. Good. So enjoying this twist. Thanks for the adjustment, Deborah. It helps. <laughs> now, one note I'd like to make is that we are essentially doing today's practice on our back before we do it standing up. So almost every pose that will come after, in some sense, has already been blueprinted by the ones we've just done. So in a way, we're creating sangskaras, impressions upon the body, breath, and mind that will be beneficial to us later in our practice. So the other day, we have a great monk visiting us right now, Swami Sabha Piranji. He's here at our, our center. And he was talking to someone and she asked him, I fail sometimes and often to, to recognize myself as awareness. I get caught up in the body, mind, and I react. I'm, I'm triggered by life. And it's only later that I can look back and retrospectively say, wow, that, that wasn't really aligned or you know, authentic to what I know to be true, that I am indeed Brahman, I am indeed formless awareness, I am spirit, and therefore I am beyond, as Ashtavakra says, beyond all this suffering, etc., etc. But I only know that later, in the heat of the, in the moment, <laughs> I, I lose all of that, all my Vedanta flies out the window. And Swami Sabrapiranji said something so beautiful, he said, no, even then it's valuable to retrospectively reassert, not reassert, but re-identify your identity as Brahman, even then. Because it creates, and his phrase was, a trying sangskara. Even if you fail, the important thing is that you tried. And that trying sangskara will become more and more natural until in each and every moment, you remember that you are awareness. Positive sangskaras. Inhale, bring that left leg back up to center and hug both knees into the chest now. Beautifully done. Pause a moment and return to the breath. See if the breath has changed, if that rhythm is still there. And if it's not, that's okay. But if you'd like, you can also reassert the rhythm, flexing the toes back, breathing through the arches of the feet, breathing in four, 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 four rhythm, that, you know, tintal, whatever rhythm you want. And then rolling to the right, let's make our way to tabletop pose. So pushing with the palms into the mat, letting the head be the last thing to come up, we find our way to tabletop pose. We're transitioning to the second segment of our class, the more fluid, flowy part. All right. So hands under the shoulders, knees under the hips, spreading the fingers. Inhale, lifting the chin, arching the upper back, taking cow pose. Exhaling, tucking the chin, rounding the upper back, lifting the navel into the spine, cat pose. So flow like that a few times, inhaling, sternum forward and up, shoulder blades pressing into the back. Exhale, shoulders move towards the ears, belly moves up towards the spine, shoulder blades spreading apart. And be sure to press down through the circumference of the palm 
as well as the thumb and first finger. So let this be about the hands also, pressing through the palms and pressing through the knees. And as you exhale, again, involve the hands and knees. Ground down to rebound up. And some of you might be inspired to add other motions, like for instance, leaning forward, spiraling this way and that. You can move the sh uh, uh, shoulders around the wrist and the hips around the knees to move the back in circles as if you're painting a big you know, circle on the wall or something like that. So feel free to do this. Really, we're lubricating the base of the spine, just creating some kind of motion some rajas in the body in order to move towards sattva. So whenever you're ready, you can exhale, tuck the toes, lift the hips and meet me in downward facing dog. Whenever you're finished playfully expressing, you can continue your expression into downward facing dog. Now bending just the left knee, keep the right leg straight, pour attention into the right heel, firm the right thigh, release the right heel into the floor and then bend both knees and alternate, straightening the left leg, keep the right knee bent. Pour attention into the right heel. All the while, ground down through the inner edge of the palm, thumb and first finger. Now bending both knees, you can start to alternate more vigorously, straightening one knee, then bending the other. And as if you were pedaling out a bicycle or something, you may start to open up the calf and open up the hamstring. Chances are they're already pretty open from all that Sukta Parangushtasana, but it can't hurt to add a few more movements. Whenever you feel like it, bend both knees, send the belly a little closer towards the thighs, drop the neck and head, and then start to straighten the knees coming into the fullest expression of Adho, Mukka, Shvanasana that you'd like to do today. Downward facing dog. Releasing the neck and head, and maybe turning your palms outward slightly. Middle finger of the right hand towards one o'clock, middle finger of the left hand towards 11 o'clock. The idea is just to broaden across the chest, Roll the upper outer arms down and under and press through the inner edge of the palm, the radial joint. And pause here for a few moments. Enjoy it. Good. Now inhale, shift forward, coming into plank pose, Ardha Chaturanga Dandasana, half forearm staff pose, and hold that plank for a moment. A smidgen lower with the hips, Angela, just a smidgen. Good. Firming the thighs, lifting the belly, and softening the jaw. Exhale, go back to downward facing dog. So pressing into the inner edges of the palms, pushing back to downward facing dog. Inhaling, coming forward to plank pose. Shoulders away from the ears, thighs firm. Exhale, going back to downward facing dog. Very nice. Grounding down through the heels. One more time, come to plank. And remember to keep your heels grounding. So even in plank, you're pressing your heels back and firming the thighs. The legs are very active here in plank. Side of the navel lifting. Perfect, Angela. Beautiful. Holding that for a moment. Climbing the crown of the head forward while you send the shoulder heads back. Now let's lower to the floor. Shift the shoulders ahead of the wrist. Wonderful. Exhale, elbows in and come down. Maybe thighs, chest, forehead, maybe like a chaturanga. In either case, meet me with the whole body on the floor, prone. Elbows in. And the idea is that the elbows line up with the shoulder heads. Walk the palms back so the thumbs line up with the nipple line. Next, as you lift your shoulders away from your ears, you should feel a spaciousness in the front of your chest and in the back of your neck. Now, keeping the chin tucked, Jalandara Bandha, start to come up into cobra pose. Thighs are firm. Backs of the feet are pressing into the mat. Chin is in, but chest is moving forward and up. Hold this a moment. And exhale, lower back down. So we'll do a kind of vini yoga type thing here. Moving in and out of Bhujangasana, cobra. So inhale, maybe a baby cobra lifting the face, chest, one or two ribs. Maybe a slightly higher cobra. Shoulders down and back, threading the chest forward through the biceps. Exhale, come down. Strengthening the back muscles here. Coiling from the lower back one more time, taking your cobra. Now, as you know, in the full cobra, the elbows are straight, but the pelvis is on the floor. So if you want to straighten your elbows, gradually you can, but I like keeping my elbows bent for cobra. It's a kind of 
Nice thing. Either way, exhale, lower down to the floor. Now, option to take Urdhva Mukha Shvanasana, upward facing dog, as opposed to Cobra, or just to do another Cobra. So inhale, Bhujangasana, or Urdhva Mukha Shvanasana, upward facing dog. Shoulders down and back, chest broad. Now hold this for a moment. It's as if you are threading your belly through the forearms and threading the chest through the biceps. Good. And then on the exhalation, tuck the toes. And if you'd like, go straight back to down dog or maybe take a chaturanga first. So it's up to you. You can take chaturanga and then down dog or go straight back to down dog. Beautifully done. Now let's add our teen tal, our breathing rhythm of 16 beats. So it's all up to you, your own rhythm. Inhale, take a whole four beats to come forward to plank. Let the inhale guide you into plank pose. Hold plank for four beats. You're holding the breath, but keep the jaw soft. Exhale from this exhalation, take four beats to come down. Beautiful descend, Madeline. And now on the inhalation, take four whole beats to come up to cobra. Elbows in, shoulders down and back, chin in. Good. And then exhale, tuck the toes, lift the hips. Either you go through chaturanga and then back to dog or straight to dog. Take four whole beats to get there. And then pause here for however long, maybe another whole teen tal. It's one of my favorite rhythms in um, music, in Indian classical music. But there are so many, there are so many different rhythms. And uh, I know Chandraji will enjoy this, but that little app, iTabla Pro, you can get it on the phone. It's got all these different rhythms that you can play with. And you can use that for yoga practice. You can play with all the different rhythms. Anyway, let's do that whole thing again, that quote unquote vinyasa. Inhale, shift forward, shoulders moving first above the wrist for plank, holding plank for four beats, then shifting the shoulders ahead of the wrist while lowering down for four beats, maybe pausing at elbow height for chaturanga. Inhale, taking cobra or up dog. And exhale, tucking the toes, lifting the hips, going back to downward facing dog. So just to kind of create that sense of rhythm and flow, which we're going to keep up for today's practice. One last time, inhaling, shifting the shoulders forward, thighs are firm, sides of the navel lifted, yet jaw soft, breath soft. Now let's shift the shoulders ahead of the wrist, elbows in, pause in Chaturanga, some of you. And Jenna is demonstrating a very nice Chaturanga here. And when you're ready, you can go from Chaturanga to Up Dog, or you can go to Bhujangasana. Exhale, coming back to Chaturanga, then Down Dog, or going straight to Down Dog. Chandraji, remember to keep the chin in for Cobra or Up Dog. So Jalandara Bandha, chin in, chest up. Think that picture of Krishna Macharya Ji. You know, he has the Jalandara Bandha in when he's doing any of these poses. It's kind of a good picture to look at. It's rather dramatic chin tuck there. All right, now inhale, lift the right leg up into the air and exhale, sweep the right knee forward and plant that right foot down. Bring the left knee to the floor and take a kind of crescent pose with the left knee to the floor. It's a kind of modified crescent. Lift the arms up into the air, arch the upper back. Some of you will press palms, lift the chin. Others will have the hands about as wide or wider than the shoulder distance. Exhale, bring the hands down over the heart now. So Anjali Mudra or Namaskar. And then inhale, take the arms, cactus arms. Elbows are on the height of the shoulders. Lift the chin, arch the back one more time. Press in through the right big toe mound. Very nice, Anisha. Take a nice deep back bend, as deep as you'd like. And then exhale, bring the hands back over the heart. And one more time, inhale. Anisha Ji, you might like to reach the hands back, actually, uh, arms in extension, and see if you can graze the fingertips on the floor. Inhale, lift the chin. No, no, other way, arms in extension. Reach the arms like, sorry, I'm in the monastery, like, like that, arms reaching back. Yeah, okay, lift the chin. Yeah, there you go. Lift the chin, arch the upper back, and you can rest your fingertips on the floor if you're a backbender or just uh, move to that direction. Beautiful. Exhale, bring the hands back over the heart, return to neutral. Very nice, Rose. Great form there. Holding the shape by pressing the outer hips in. Now take the left elbow outside the right knee for a twist. Keep that uh, Anjali Mudra though. So the thumbs are resting against the sternum and the sternum is moving up towards the thumb. So broaden across the chest, shoulders down and back, chest broad, 
and chest pressing up into the um, thumbs. And of course, as you bring the thumbs back, Deborah has had a major upgrade of space. Wonderful. Thanks for uh, <laughs> being so many good models. There's so many great examples to use here with such great spaces. <laughs> Shoulders down and back. Hold this for just a few moments. Now, some of you, if you'd like, look up over that right shoulder, but keep the chin in. Forehead is higher than the chin. So chin is stuck. Good. Now, with this right knee, uh, sorry, left knee on the floor, you have so much stability to just hold this pose and enjoy it. Relax into it. And when you yourself feel satisfied, bring both hands flat to the floor to frame the right foot. And maybe you flow through a vinyasa, maybe you just step back to down dog. So some of you might step to plank pose, shoulders away from the ears, you lower down to chaturanga. Inhale will take you up to cobra or up dog. Exhale will take you into chaturanga, then down dog or straight into downward facing dog. And then the other side now, lifting the left leg up into the air and exhale, sweeping the left knee forward and placing that left foot down with poise, tact, and grace. Bringing the right knee to the floor, taking the arms up into the air. Some of you might press palms, lift the chin and arch the upper back. Others amongst you might have the arms wide, slightly like a V shape. And take your back bend. Alanasana, alasana, but anjanayasana. So a lunge, but a crescent moon pose. Exhale, bring the hands down over the heart. Inhale, cactus arms, elbows at the height of the shoulders. Lift the chin, arch the upper back. It's an upper thoracic back bend. So the pelvis stays rather neutral. Yeah, good adjustment there, Jenna. Exhale, bring the hands back over the heart. And now, one last time, some of you might, backbenders might like to enjoy reaching the hands back for an extra challenge. Everybody can benefit from reaching the arms back in extension, lifting the chin and arching the upper back. So it's like you're trying to graze the floor with your fingertips if your arms are in extension. If your arms are in flexion, then reach the arms up, lift the chin, arch the upper back, broaden across the chest. Very nice. Exhale, bring the hands over the heart and take your twist. So bringing the right elbow outside the left knee now. Imagine there was this wall behind you and your intention was to melt the right shoulder blade, sorry, the left shoulder blade into the wall behind you. Very nice, Rose. Beautiful form with the hands and the chest. Keep the chin in and get as much of the right elbow and the right tricep outside the left knee as possible. Now note, this is just what you did on the floor. It's almost exactly that twist with a little bit of a nuance. Chin a little more in, Deborah. Yeah, forehead higher than the chin. So it's a kind of neutral spine and spacious in the back of the neck. Beautifully done. Remember to press down through the left big toe mound, as well as hugging the outer hips in for stability. Bring the hands to the floor and go back to your downward facing dog. Or some of you might like to flow through vinyasas. So you might step back to plank. Uh, maybe for fun, you'll keep that left leg hovering in the air as you take your plank. Shoulders away from ears, elbows in, come up to cobra or upward facing dog. Exhale, go back to downward facing dog, tucking the toes, lifting the hips. Yes, good job there, Madeline, on coming up from the floor into plank. That's a very wonderful way to strengthen the core. Now, holding downward facing dog, pause a few moments here. And in your own time, walk your palms back towards the feet, paw print by paw print, holding opposite elbows. Let's now bend the uh, knees slightly and fold the belly over the thighs. I recommend bending the knees typically for tight hamstrings, but given that we've already created some heat in the body, you might like to straighten the knees a bit more to taste. You may sway the elbows side to side, nod the head yes or shake the head no. You might pick up all 10 toes and spread them, placing them down one at a time. Maybe you could even play this game of trying to see the color of your mat or floor in between the toes. And ultimately, straightening the knees, folding the belly over the thighs, any amount that you'd like. Upper back is rounding. Now let's interlace the fingers behind the back and press the knuckles up towards the ceiling. Here you'll feel your shoulder heads lifting away from your ears. Beautiful, Angela. So the idea is to create all that space at the base of the neck 
And even as you lift the shoulder heads up, drop the neck and head. So it seems kind of counterintuitive. So it's two directions, shoulders moving up, but head kind of dropping down. Feel the tips of your shoulder blades spinning towards one another and pressing into the back body. Feel that sense of closing up in the back body and opening up in the front body. Those who are in the Spanda studies, you know, this is Unmesha and Nimesha, that tantric principle of contraction and expansion. Contraction of one thing is an expansion of something else, like in the Shiva Linga. There's always this ebb and flow and throb. All right, releasing the hands, bring the hands to the hips, and then let's rise up to standing. So keeping the thighs firm, hinging from the hips, rising up to standing. Let the hands fall to the sides of the torso and take your tadasana, mountain pose. So the idea now is for the thighs to be firm and yet lift the frontal hip bones forward. You can spread the fingers slightly or you can have the fingers relaxed and released. Iyengarji, uh, Guruji Iyengar would always say, firm the fingers. He, he seemed to, one place he said, even the hands want to do yoga. You know, the idea is there should be a kind of um, intention even in the hands. But in some other schools, the hands are limp and you're allowing the arms to just kind of weigh the shoulders down away from the ears. In any case, this is a great pose to really just take the time with and develop. As you know, it's the blueprint of almost every standing pose. And it marks a transition now into our like third and second to last part of the class. So now the dance happens on our feet. And so we have to feel where the weight is in the feet. Feel the big toe mound, little toe mound, inner edge of the heel, outer edge of the heel. Spread the toes a bit. Lean forward. Most of us have a little too much weight in the heels typically. So we have to shift a, a few inches forward into the toes. When we feel centered, then feel how the arches are lifting up naturally. Okay, good. Let's make our way to the front of the mat now. So we'll be able to do our Surya Namaskar A series and we'll thread a few poses into it. So from the Surya Namaskar A, uh, or rather from this Tadasana, let's move into Surya Namaskar A from Ashtanga uh, Patabi Joy's thing. So inhale, lift the arms up through the sides of the body or up through the front. And maybe take a back bend, lift the chin, arch the upper back. You might enjoy something like you did earlier. Exhale, fold forward, hinge from the hips. Maybe you can take the arms out wide. In any case, drop the neck and head, palms flat. And Jenna, walk the palms back so the fingertips line up with the toes. Yeah, there we go. That's it. So in this Uttanasana, the idea is to have four feet on the floor. Fingertips line up with the toe tips. Elbows in somewhat. Yeah, just like Chaturanga, elbows are somewhat in. Shoulders lift away from the ears. That's it. Now feel the stretch in your middle and upper back. Drop the neck and head, even as you lift the shoulders up away from the ears. Kind of like what you did earlier when you had your fingers interlaced behind the back. Anyway, inhale, come up halfway. Fingertips might be on the floor or hands might be on the sides of the um, shins. Now, tuck the chin in slightly, most of us, to line up the crown of the head with the opening in the throat. This makes more anatomical sense than lifting the chin and compressing the back of the neck. So feel that out in your body. Chin is tucked, so the back of the neck is spacious. Yeah, much better. Good, Rose. Very nice. Perfect there. And then exhale, bend the knees, palms flat. Press the palms to the floor. Step the right foot back to plank. Step the left foot back to plank. And shifting the shoulders forward ahead of the wrist, start to descend to the floor now. Elbows in as you come down. Belly lifted. Inhale, take your cobra or your upward facing dog. Chin in, shoulders down and back. Press the backs of the feet into the floor. Thighs firm. Exhale, tuck the toes. Go back to your downward facing dog. Now we'll thread a few poses into this. Inhale, lift that right leg up into the air. Exhale, shift forward, sweeping the right knee forward and plant the right foot down. Now I should have cued this earlier, but we're going to do warrior three in this sequence. So if you need your blocks at the front of the mat, you might get them now. Have the blocks there if you need, or a chair or whatever. In any case, we're going to take crescent moon pose. So with that left knee lifted, take the arms up into the air. 
option to bring the left knee to the floor anytime you want. So that's always an option. Now I recommend keeping the left knee bent first to support the lower back coming into this pose. Then I often invite you to firm that left thigh. So left thigh is firm, left leg is firm. So take the bend out of the left knee, try that. And you'll get a, a bit more vigor in the lower body part of the pose. Yes. And of course, remember for the lower back, you can keep that left knee bent any amount. All right. Now from this crescent moon pose, bring the hands down over the heart, shift a little more weight into the front of the foot. No one is spotlighted. So you're in your own space now. You can play with this as much as you'd like. Uh, bring the weight into the front of the right foot and then start to step that left foot up towards the right heel and then lift that left heel up. Good. So we're coming into warrior three pose. Vira, Badra, three. Now, some of you will have the hands over the heart. Some of you will reach the arms forward. Some of you will reach the arms back. Some of you will have the hands on the blocks or chairs. Every configuration is fine. Firm the left thigh. Now, isn't this just Supta Padangushtasana? It's the same. You did it on your back already. Nothing new here. All right. Rose, do some uh, Shavasana before you go, okay? So just lie on the floor for like five or so minutes if you can. All right. Now start to bend that standing leg, send the lifted leg back, come back into crescent moon pose, lift the arms up into the air, crescent moon shape. And then exhale, bring the hands down over the heart. All right, bring the left heel to the floor, turn the left toes out slightly, hands on the hips. And we're going to take now a uh, side angle pose. So first draw the right hip back and draw the left hip forward. You're squaring your pelvis towards the front of the mat. Yes. So remember, this is Parvotanasana. So as Angela is demonstrating here, the pelvis is squared to the front of the mat. Now firm that left thigh. So left, sorry, right thigh, right knee is straight. Yeah, so straightening the right knee, good. So here, before we even do anything, start to press down. That's it, Chandraji, right knee straight. Start to press down with that right big toe and the outer edge of the left heel or the outer edge of the left foot. Really feel your foundations here in the pose. Now the hands are on the hips. But if you'd like, you can now take a reverse namaskar, bringing the palms together and flipping that namaskar. As Angela is demonstrating, you can do that. Others amongst you might like to just keep your hands on your hips. Both are fine. Now we're going to fold the belly forward over the thighs. You might like to have blocks around the feet as Angela is doing here. In any case, fold forward and stop halfway. So pausing in a kind of ardha parjvotanasana. Good. Holding this pose for a moment, firm the right thigh, lift the right hip up and back as you send the left hip forward and down. Good. Now exhale and fold the belly over the right thigh. Very nicely done. You can drop the neck and the head, but the shoulders are always lifting away from the ears. Press down through the right big toe and send that right hip back. Yes. And so unless there's something wrong in the body, we keep that right knee, not wrong, but a complication in the body, we keep the right knee as straight as possible. However, you can bend the right knee slightly if you're hyperextending. Yes. That's it, Jenna. Beautiful. Paj vo tan asana. Tan means to stretch. Parjva, parjva means like revolved or side. So this pose really, it means like side stretch pose. And I think I accidentally translated it wrong. I translated Parjvo Konasana. My bad. I meant to say Parjvo Tanasana. The English didn't quite work out there. <laughs> I said angle. My bad. Okay. Hold this pose for as long as you'd like. It's a very beautiful pose. A forward fold. An inversion. Head is lower than the heart. And when you're finished, hands on the hips maybe. Come back out of the pose. If your hands are in reverse namaskar, you can keep them there and slowly unwind. All right, beautifully done. Now we'll take kind of our peak pose of the day before we close out and cool down. And that is Parjvo Trikonasana, revolved triangle. So taking the left arm up into the air, keep the right hand on the right hip. It's nice to have a block on the outside edge of that right foot in case you might need it. Now, first, 
fold forward halfway. Hands, right hand on the hip, left arm reaching forward, fold forward halfway as Angela is doing here. Now keep the weight in that right big toe as you bring that left hand down to the block or floor outside the right foot. Then take the right arm up into the air as you roll the right ribs back. That's it. Here we are in Parjvo Trikonasana. Or you could even call it Pavrita Trikonasana. Pavrita is, I think, a more common name. Pavrita means to like revolve. Parjva means side. Pavrita means revolve. So here we are in this revolved triangle. It's a very advanced pose, actually. Intermediate to advanced. So enjoy that you're doing it. And then whenever you're happy with it, you can hold it for as long or as little as you want. Play with it. And when you're done, and by the way, to get balance, press down through the right big toe, hug the outer hips in. When you're finished, bend the right knee, reframe the right foot with both hands, lift the left heel off the floor, coming onto the ball of the left foot, and float through your second to last vinyasa for this practice. Stepping the left leg back, sorry, right leg back, shifting the shoulders forward, elbows in, lower down, inhale, come up cobra or up dog, exhale, tuck the toes, lift the hips, go back to down dog. Beautiful, so that exact sequence now on the right side, so you know what's coming, it might change your experience. Inhale, lift the left leg up on the second side, sorry. Send that left knee forward and plant the left foot down. And first, let's take crescent moon pose. Inhale, keep that right knee lifted. Maybe that right knee is bent slightly as you reach the arms up into the air, lifting the chin, arching the upper back. Now here, that left knee is bent. Remember, your right knee can come to the floor anytime if you'd like. Oh, it's such a cute photo, Madeline. All three of you here. This is so cute. <laughs> anyway, exhale, bring the hands over the heart. Oh, we'll shift the uh, weight into that uh, left big toe. Maybe have your blocks ready for Vira Badrasana. So spotlight is off for everyone. So play with it. Don't forget to wobble. Don't forget to enjoy. Fall down a couple of times. All part of the fun. Lift that right foot up. And remember, if you keep your left knee bent, you'll have a bit more balance. So left knee can be as bent as you'd like for it to be. Nice bent left knee. Anisha, point your toes to the floor. So neutral left, uh, yeah, there we go, that's it. Neutral right thighs. Good. Enjoy, shoulders away from the ears. Maybe you reach your arms forward. Maybe you reach the arms back. Maybe you have the hands over the heart. Enjoy. And then when you feel like it, bend that standing leg, send the lifted leg way back, come out into crescent moon pose, lifting the arms up into the air. Exhale, bring the hands over the heart and then hands to the hips. Bring the right heel to the floor, straighten the left knee. So here we are again, setting up for Parjvo Tan Asana. Not Konasana, my bad. So taking the right hip forward now and taking the left hip back, squaring the pelvis towards the front of the mat, pressing through the left big toe mount and the outer edge of the right heel. So really get the foundations down first before moving into the shape. Now, some of you will take your reverse Namaskar. If you feel like it, you can do reverse Namaskar. Others will just keep the hands on the hips. Both are great. As you inhale, maybe you can take a back bend. Sometimes it's nice to just lift the chin and arch the upper back or not. That's up to you. Nice, Deborah. And exhale, fold forward, hinging from the hips, folding forward. Good. Now keep the chin kind of in neutral. So the chin is not lifted nor excessively tucked. So Deborah, lift your chin slightly. Yeah, halfway forward fold. There we go. So it's like an Ardha Parjvotanasana. Perfect, Deborah. That's it. Now hold this for a moment. Take that left hip back and up as you spin the right hip down and forward. Press through the, ah, that's it. Press through the left big toe mound. Then finally on the exhale, having lengthened through the sides of the torso, now come down. Maybe your hands come to the floor or blocks. Maybe the hands, you know, on the hips, whatever you'd like. Tuck the chin, round the upper back and melt the belly into that thigh. It's a very beautiful shape. I've heard it called pyramid pose. 
I, I never really knew why. And then one day I saw it. I was like, oh, the legs make that little pyramid. Isn't that right? I think that's why they call it pyramid pose. But I like, you know, sometimes going around the world, like different places have different names for poses. So like, for instance, in New York, it's something else. In LA, it's something else. Like in New York, I think they use the word Anjanayasana, which is lunch. Sometimes they use that for crescent moon pose. On the West Coast, Alasana can mean crescent moon. So I've always like really enjoyed how different cultures have interpreted the Sanskrit words and the shapes of the pose. Very cool. Like Utkatasana, right? Ut means intense. So Utkatasana, it really, I think in Sanskrit means intense, fierce pose or something. But I've heard it called horseman's pose, chair pose, etc., etc. Now I'm geeking out because there are other yoga teachers in the room. So pardon my, uh, my coffee room conversation here. <laughs> and whenever you feel finished with the pose, you can come out. You can bring the hands to the hips. Remember to ground down through the left big toe. Come out the way you came in. So come out halfway, hinging from the hips, then come out all the way out. Take your time going in and out. Take the right arm up into the air now. Some of you might like to have the blocks on the outside edges of the left foot, right arm reaches up. Now the idea here is to lengthen through the side of the torso on the right side. So reach through the right fingertips, lengthen through the right side of the torso, and then start to fold forward and pause halfway. Hinge from the hips, reaching through the right fingertips. Draw that left hip back and up, even as you press down through the left big toe. Now, when you have maximum length in the torso, bring that right hand down to the floor or block on the outside edge of the left foot. So as far as possible, try to get that hand outside the left foot. It's okay if it's inside, but we want it to be outside for the tightest possible twist. And so, you know, looking around the room, there are of course many seasoned practitioners. And so we are exploring some rather intermediate to advanced poses. Trikonasana, that's a nice kind of, you know, easier, easier pose, but Pavrita Trikonasana requires quite a lot of subtlety. So wherever we might be in our yoga journey, enjoy that we're doing this pose, a beautiful shape. If Goraksha Nath was here, he'd be very impressed and happy. You know, it's among his more advanced stuff in his series of 84. Many of these poses are not scriptural, meaning they were developed much later in the 20th century because of the influence of British gymnastics. But I think if Gorakshanath saw them, he'd be quite impressed. All right, now bring the hands down. You can bend that standing, uh, sorry, that front leg. You can roll onto the ball of the right foot, getting off of the right heel and flow through your final vinyasa. And now we're closing our class. This is your final vinyasa, taking one more cobra or up dog. Exhaling, going back to down dog and pausing in down dog for a bit. So in our final 15 minutes together, we are going to gradually from all this heat return to stillness. The idea is from rajas, using rajas, we leave tamas and enter into sattva. Exhale, bring the knees to the floor, sink the hips into the heels and relax. Child's pose. Here we are in any version of Balasana that you'd like. So you might have the hands reaching back as Angela is demonstrating here. You might make um, a pillow with your forearms to rest your forehead. You might bring in an actual pillow for your forehead. You might roll up a blanket for the ankles or place blanket under the knees. You might bring a bolster in between the thighs to rest the belly and the chest, whatever you'd like to do. And rest.
in the Bhagavad Gita, there is frequent references to pratyahara, the action of withdrawing back towards the center, towards the inner world. And the image given is of a turtle withdrawing its limbs back into the shell. In fact, during the Dhyana Mantra in Tantric Puja, we do the Kurma Mudra, the tortoise um, gesture. Probably, I don't know if, to what extent this is true, but my, my, my feeling is that the reason we do that is because of the inwardness that we remember when we consider the tortoise. So imagine you are now a tortoise withdrawing all the indriyas, all the sense organs back towards their source, where typically the prana flows out towards the world. You are now redirecting that prana to flow towards the heart, towards the center. And as we move towards the end of our class, I thought I'd share something that is very profound. And Swami Sarvar Priyanamji shared it yesterday. Um, last night he gave a talk and he shared this point. Funnily enough, we too are studying Swami Ashokanandaji. The lecture that we had on Monday was drawn quite a lot from Swami Ashokananda's lecture that he gave in San Francisco very many years ago. Now, Swami Ashokananda, of course, is a realized soul and all that. And Swami Sarvar Priyanamji was saying, there are things <clears throat> that you hear from these jivan muktas that sometimes you don't find anywhere else. And Swami Ashokanandaji, apparently in his talk, The Razor's Edge, said something about pranayama that is rather revolutionary. He first claimed that all the pranayama that we do with the breath, like closing one nostril, opening the other, is nice but superficial. It doesn't address the underlying pranic problem. And I'm paraphrasing now, but Swami Ashokanandaji implied that real pranayama, like actual harnessing and controlling of the energies of the body, is really about not wasting that energy in the outward tendencies that we have. Where that energy would otherwise spray out into the world and disperse over so many scattered desires. Now, like so many scattered rays of sun, they are concentrated into a single laser beam of energy towards spiritual life. So what Swami Ashokanandaji said is this, real pranayama, and I'm paraphrasing, real pranayama is the final and irrevocable realization that there is nothing in the world of the senses that could be ultimately and lastingly fulfilling. Although the accolades of the ego and the gratification of the senses are somewhat nice in the beginning and give partial satisfaction, the moment we decide that we won't settle for that is the moment we begin genuine spiritual life and is the moment our priorities change and is the moment our prana is conserved channelized, harnessed, and redirected. Brilliant. Swami Ashokananda is saying pranayama is an action of the intellect, not necessarily of the nostrils. <laughs> so now do your pranayama, Allah Ashokananda Ji Swami. Say to yourself, O oh mind, what have you found in your so many incarnations of wandering the wasteland of this world with all of its seemingly beautiful things that are shiny on the surface and yet somehow empty on the inside. What have you been looking for, oh my mind? And have you found it? Oh mind, I don't mean to repress you or suppress you. Please go out and enjoy all those things that you think are worth enjoying. Please, there's nothing wrong with them. There's no hell that I'm going to go to. There's no devil or anything trying to tempt me. This world is here for me to play in. But oh my mind, how many times can you play this game? Have you not intuited the limitations in your outwardness? How about, oh my mind, you and I 
take a trip back home to the source from which all these worlds arose in the first place. If in your heart there is the clarion call sounding the march back home to infinity, oh mind, why not answer? Why tarry a moment more? Why delay by the side of the road? What I am seeking, this world nor that can give. If you right now at this moment, commit or consecrate the rest of your life to the pursuing of higher truth, eschewing lower, baser goals for that which is sacred and divine, that, according to Swami Ashokanandaji, is pranayama. And really, that's asana, steadiness. The real asana is to be seated in your resolve, to be clear as to what the purpose of your life is for. If you know that this life is for God-realization, self-realization, whatever you want to call it, if you know that this life is for the manifestation of your highest ideal of truth, beauty, and sacredness, that is asana, and that will give you pranayama. All right. So before we end, two final poses. You may skip or do them if you'd like. Some of you might just go straight to shavasana. Others might like to take pashimottanasana. So straightening the legs in front of you, taking pashimottanasana, which is um, a very nice cooling pose. Forward fold over the straight legs, flexing the toes back, scrubbing the heels forward. Now, knees can be as straight or maybe even slightly bent as you'd like them to be. I recommend sitting on the edge of a blanket. So as Angela G is showing here, sitting on the blanket can give you much more um, access to the pose. And then taking the arms up into the air, exhaling, folding forward, and enjoying this closing, cooling pose. Pashimottanasana. The idea is to send your chest to the toes, to reach the sternum forward, lengthening through the sides of the torso and creating as much space as possible in the lower back. Very nice, Sydney. Maybe, Sydney, hold the outside edges of the feet and then let your elbows fall to the floor. Yeah, beautiful. And then flex the toes back, pressing the big toe mount forward and the little toe mount back. Spreading the toes. Yeah, there we go. Excellent form. And here, feel the stretching in the middle and upper back. The more you round your back, the more of a back stretch this will be. And the more you straighten your knees and send your chest forward, the more of a hamstring and calf opener this will be. Uh, Paul Greer, the yin yoga fellow, he said to me, no, he didn't say to me, he said to someone else that you can't do both. And he was, he, in, at that time he had this like skeleton like a kind of, it's very eerie actually. He has this like prop and it's just a spine. It's like a spine with floating ribs and he bends it this way and that like a mad scientist. And he was showing how if you're bending, if your back is rounded, that will give you a stretch in your upper back, but it won't give you a stretch as much in the backs of your legs. But if you want to straighten your knees and stretch the hamstrings, that will cause the back to flatten. So he was showing me that, uh, showing that other student that it was, um, mutually exclusive to some degree. So do what you'd like, back or hamstrings or whatever. And then continue to reflect. What are you looking for? What do you want? Why are you practicing? What have you sensed in this practice? What is its promise to you? Why meditate? Why attend lectures? Why do Hatha Yoga? Why not, I don't know, like do pleasure seeking activities alone? You could all have been working on your investment portfolio in this time. Why not do that? Why are you here? What do you hope to gain from any of this? And now here's the challenge. 
or rather the invitation, if you have sensed anything at all in this practice, any possibility for a higher life, why not give yourself to it completely? In other words, why approach things with a lukewarm devotion? The invitation is always to plunge in, dive deep, O oh mind, dive deep into the self. Think of nothing else. What else could capture the imagination more than this? What other life could present more of an adventure than spiritual life? And as we said on Monday, what else can you be sure of other than the own indubitable aliveness that you are? Some of you now will go straight to Shavasana. Others amongst you, often like a closing, you know, inversion of some sort, you might like to take the legs up the wall for Viparita Karani. Some of you like to take Salamba Sarvangasana shoulder stand. So uh, whichever one you'd like, some like to drape the feet over a couch or over um, a bed. Some like to do Halasana and Karnapidasana without Salamba Sarvangasana. That's up to you. Yes, and first come to plow pose. So first, if you're taking Salamba Sarvangasana, bring the toes to the floor behind the crown of the head. Then from plow pose, Halasana, from there you walk the hands up the back. So walk the hands as high up the back as possible. And then from this plow pose, Halasana, now you start to lift your legs up into the air, standing on the outer edges of your shoulders and grounding into the I guess the back of the neck, chin is tucked. And this is our final pose before Shavasana. So it's the last kind of doing there is in this class. And I invite you to do it for as long as you'd like. Eventually, at your own time and pace, you will bring the back to the floor, vertebra by vertebra. You might take Karna Pidasana. I really like Karna Pidasana to close, where you bring the feet down to the floor for plow. So tips of the toes are on the floor. And then you bend the knees so the knees are on the outside edges of the face. And you hold opposite elbows around the knees. Ear pressure pose, Karna Pidasana. Yeah, just like that, Madeline. I love this pose because it's like, so introspective. It's like you're closing the ears against the outside world. Now, don't misunderstand. We are not saying the outside world is degenerate or evil and must be pushed away like, ugh, no, I want to go inward. Outside world is bad. No, it's not that. Rather, we go inward to understand what the outward world really is. This journey is a journey in three steps. One, distaste for the material world. Two, pursuing spiritual life, which is progressive inwardness. And three, realizing that the material world was nothing but spirit to begin with. So really, you start with your eyes open and you're frowning. Then you close your eyes. And when you open them again, you're smiling. We'll all now end in Shavasana. So come and lie down in Shavasana. And here we are at the end of our class. Time now is 3.30 in Southern California. So some of you might like to take your Shavasana alone in, in the privacy of your own space. Others might stick around for five more minutes. I typically do like a closing meditation. Totally optional, not to keep anyone here. If you need to go, please. But otherwise, I'm going to do an Ashtavakra Gita type of meditation and then leave you to silence. If you have the luxury today, the space in your schedule, I invite you to just be in this Anandasana. Purushaji, the, when we met, he called this Anandasana. And I love that. Bliss pose, Shavasana, corpse pose. You are invited always to be in this for as long as you'd like. Why do only 10 minutes? Stay here for 30 Something like that. Up to you, of course. And just rest.
So alas, Sri Ramakrishna has different plans. He has somehow hidden the Ashtavakra Gita from me. I can't find it here where it typically is in the library. But somehow or other, right next to the computer, someone has left Swami Yatishwarananda's Meditation and Spiritual Life. So I think what I'll do instead is just read you the opening paragraph from this book. Now, this is chapter one of Swami Yatishwarananda's Meditation and Spiritual Life. And this is called The Spiritual Quest. After I finish reading the passage, I'm going to chant and just end the meeting. So no need to say goodbye or anything. Just rest and enjoy your own time and space. Thank you all for coming. And I'm excited to see you soonest. Spiritual conversion. The young prince Siddhartha was sitting alone under a tree in his palace garden, absorbed in his thoughts. It was midnight and the whole world lay hushed in darkness and silence. He had just then left the banquet hall, having got disgusted with the noise and mirth of dancing girls. An intense dissatisfaction, a deep void was growing within him. All of a sudden, there arose strange voices. As he listened, he heard some celestial beings singing in chorus. We moan for rest, alas, but rest we can never find. We know not whence we come, nor where we float away. Time and again we tread this round of smiles and tears. In vain we pine to know whither our pathway leads and why we play this empty play. Rise, dreamer, from your dream and slumber not again. Siddhartha rose from his seat, had a last look at his sleeping wife and child, and set out on his historic journey that ultimately made him the Buddha, the enlightened one. Buddha was not alone in taking to the spiritual path. The Katopanishad says, arise, awake, and realize the truth following the great teachers. Indeed, from time immemorial, God has been speaking to man through the great scriptures to take up the cross and follow him. And in obedience to this call, thousands of people in the East and in the West have given up their all and taken this journey into the superconscious realms. For ordinary people, this world and its pleasures are of great importance. But there are people who hunger and thirst after the eternal and the infinite. Think of Swami Vivekananda's struggles and relentless search for truth. He was extraordinarily pure, strong, handsome, intelligent, and talented. He could have risen to any height in worldly life if he had only cared to. The poverty and helplessness of his family was another compelling force to draw him into worldly life. But in spite of all these, he chose the path of renunciation and service. One day or another, in the life of every man, must come a time when he too feels the call of the spiritual ideal. When such a call comes, he cannot but listen to it. Nothing in the world can then give him satisfaction. He can never find peace until he follows the dictates of that higher call. This inner awareness, this compelling urge to follow the higher ideal, marks the beginning of spiritual life. The spiritual ideal then fascinates him and haunts him all through life. This change from following worldly ideals to following a spiritual ideal is called conversion. Spiritual life begins with that. In the case of some people, this conversion is sudden. In the case of others, it is a gradual development. The number of people who undergo such a genuine con conversion is rather small at any time in any country. Whether you like it or not, true spiritual life is only for a chosen few. There can never be any mass spirituality, however beautiful this ide ideal may seem to you. The Bhagavad Gita says that out of thousands of people, only few take to spiritual life. 
And out of the latter, fewer still really attain the highest superconscious realization. But let us all think we are the, these chosen few and strive to make ourselves fit for the fulfillment of this highest spiritual ideal. Om Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsa Sangate Shupajayate Sangat Sanjaya Kamaha Kamat Krodho Bhijayate Krishna says to Arjuna, chapter 2, verse 62. O Arjuna, by dwelling on the senses, one becomes attached. From attachment, for, sorry, from dwelling on sense objects, vishayan, one becomes attached, and from attachment comes desire, and from desire comes anger. Therefore, eschew these things. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnam Mudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Seek out the wholeness that you are. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto us all. Harihi Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanam Astu May this be an offering to Shri Ramakrishna.